Living fully in an age of decline. Essential wisdom for hard times. My name is Michael Dowd, and I'm recording this on the winter solstice in the Northern Hemisphere 2022. I consider this program Sanity 101, and this is the basic training. This is the full enchilada. Uh, I've also recorded a Cliff Notes version, a little half hour version for people. If you want to recommend this to someone else, I suggest perhaps sending them the link to the Cliff Notes version first um, so they won't be overwhelmed. <laughs> so I consider this Sanity 101, and in a very real way, it's the third of a three part series, and really the completion of a three part series that I've been working on for the last two and a half years. Collapse 101, The Inevitable Fruit of Progress, one of my most popular videos. Sustainability 101, Indigenuity is Not Optional. And the last half of that one is where I reinterpret core religious mythic concepts from an ecological and ecocentric perspective. And then this one, Sanity 101, The Basic Training. So first, what do we mean by sanity? Soundness of judgment and mental health. Thinking that is aligned with reality. And by thinking, what do you know or what do you think you know and understand? How you interpret life and experiences and your expectations, your hopes and fears. And thinking that's aligned with reality kind of begs the question, well, what do you mean by reality? I love this quote from Philip K. Dick. Reality is that which when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. Whatever else is real to that extent, time is real and nature is real in that sense. So to live in right relationship to reality is to live in right relationship to the past, right relationship to the future, and right relationship to the body of life upon which we depend, our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end. Loyal Rue is one of the leading philosophers of religion alive today. He's written a number of books. Uh, one of them is Religion is Not About God. And what he means is that religion is about our relationship to reality. And yes, reality has been personified as the various gods and goddesses. But if religion is doing its job, it's to help us live in right relationship to what's fundamentally, undeniably, and inescapably real. I love this quote. The most profound insight in the history of humankind is that we should seek to live in accord with reality. Indeed, living in harmony with reality may be accepted as a formal definition of wisdom. If we live at odds with reality, foolishly, we will be doomed. But if we live in proper relationship with reality, wisely, we can know joy independent of circumstances. Sanity 101, living fully in an age of decline, essential wisdom for hard times. No one needs convincing that we're living in hard times and in an age of chaos and breakdowns. Even those with no understanding of the runaway nature of biospheric and civilizational decline feel the stress. Just to read or watch today's propaganda, formerly known as the news, is a sobering or unsobering experience. So how do we cope? How can we stay positive? And perhaps most importantly, how can we be of support to others who are confused, angry, depressed, or filled with fear, blame, or guilt? And I suggest that the answer to those questions is fundamentally accepting four truths. Four fundamental truths is the key. So here they are. I suggest that accepting these four facts is indispensable for living fully in an age of decline. It's indispensable for having sanity in a crazy-making age. The first is that denial or adaptive inattention is widespread as civilizations decline and collapse. We don't have a single experience over, uh, over 100 examples throughout human history. We don't ever have a situation where everybody got it or even the majority of people like got it and transformed. No, most people stay in denial as long as they possibly can. Our main predicament is not climate change. It is ecological overshoot. Overshoot and collapse are, are built into the DNA of anthropocentric civilizations, that is human-centered, city-based civilizations. And calm gratitude during even the worst of times is both possible and contagious. See, the first three, it's like even in the face of that, calm gratitude 
is possible even in the worst of times, and it's contagious, and we have thousands of years of examples. So here's the outline, the big picture, understanding the nature of our predicament. First, the near universal nature of denial, denial or us. Runaway collapse, that's usually what we're mostly in denial of. Civilizational ecocide, that human-centered civilizations always create ecocide. And that it's possible to have calm gratitude, even at Tiatawaki, that is the end of the world as we know it. Acceptance, it turns out, is the key to post-doom, no-gloom peace of mind. Because awareness of ongoing, unstoppable collapse, awareness alone is hell. Only acceptance transforms lives. And finding the gift, the benefits of acceptance and trusting reality. Here's where history can serve as our teacher, staying positive and empowered, even in the worst of circumstances. These first three, these are going to be painful. This is difficult. None of us want to hear this stuff. But I encourage you to stay with it. Stay for the gold. Because that's why I'm creating. Sometimes people wonder, but say, Michael, you use a lot of the same slides and a lot of the same quotes in your programs. Why is that? Well, it's because I'm trying to always speak to somebody who's new, who's fresh, who's just coming to this. And if, uh, if you don't have the joy that passes understanding in the midst of collapse, that's why I create these videos is, is to help people move through the stages of grief. So I'll come back to that. Hope and fear are inseparable. There is no hope without fear, nor any fear without hope. Only trust can free us from the roller coaster of hope and fear. So staying sane in a crazy world starts with understanding and accepting reality as it really is, especially the things that you really don't like. That's the key. I'll come back to this theme again and again and again. So here's my thesis. The stability of the biosphere has been in decline for centuries and in runaway, unstoppable collapse for decades. This great acceleration of technology and market-driven ecocide is an easily verifiable fact. The scientific evidence is overwhelming. Evidence is also compelling that the vast majority of people will deny this, especially those still benefiting from the existing order, those legitimately concerned about the consequences of collapse, and those who fear that accepting reality means giving up. And yeah, most of us fit in that paragraph somewhere. The history of more than 80 previous boom and bust, rise and fall societies clearly reveals how and why Homo Colossus is destined for near-term extinction. Homo Colossus is a term coined by William Catton, who wrote the book Overshoot. I'll talk more about that, but it means each of us in the industrial world uses 30 to 50 times the resources and exudes 30 to 50 times the waste of Homo sapiens. That's Homo Colossus, industrial humanity. Homo Colossus is absolutely destined for near-term extinction. That may or may not mean the extinction of Homo sapiens, but it certainly is a possibility, a very real possibility. And paradoxically, acceptance of collapse and its inevitable consequences may be the single most important thing that any of us can do to live fully, fearlessly, and inspiringly, that's where you're an inspiration to others, in this age of decline. That is, at Teotihuacan. And I get that, yes, it's easier for me to say this as an old guy than if I was a 20-something or 30-something with kids or whatever, no doubt. But still, I suggest acceptance is the core to living fully and loving the life you live and living fearlessly in this time. That's the key. So how can I tell, how can you tell whether you're accepting or denying the fact that Homo Colossus is in terminal decline? Well, here are the feelings commonly associated with non-acceptance, with denial, optimism or pessimism, hope or hopelessness, anxiety, fear, guilt, desperate activism, anger and depression, and self-righteousness. And obviously, I could include other things, cynicism and that sort of thing. But here's the thing. Whether you're optimistic or pessimistic, whether you're hopeful or hopeless, 
Those are all non-acceptance because those are absurd in light of natural laws, facts, and things that were 99 to 100% certain. Of. You know, when you throw a ball into the air, you're not optimistic or pessimistic that it's going to come down. It's a fact. You know, you're not optimistic or pessimistic that the seasons will change. Things that were grounded in fact that are laws that are 99 to 100% certainty optimism and pessimism and hopefulness and hopelessness make no sense whatsoever. And so if you find yourself in one or more of these for a good portion of your time, that's why I'm creating this video is to help you come to this place. Feelings commonly associated with acceptance, trust and gratitude, awe, love, and sweet grief. I'll say more about that. Generosity and compassion calm and courageous love and action, and then joy in the little things, the daily things, including gallows humor. So here's the big picture, what I call the great story, a story that includes all stories. There is science now to construct the story of the journey that we've made on this earth, the story that connects us with all beings. Right now, we need to remember that story, to harvest it and taste it. For we are in a hard time, and it is the knowledge of the bigger story that's going to carry us through. Here's another quote from my great mentor, Joanna Macy. This is a dark time filled with suffering and uncertainty. Like living cells in a larger body, it is natural that we feel the trauma of our world. So don't be afraid of the anguish you feel or the anger or fear, because these responses arise from the depth of your caring and the truth of your interconnectedness with all beings. One of the fundamental distinctions to understand, and so much suffering is caused when people don't understand this, is the difference between problems, which can be potentially solved, and predicaments, which have no solution, only outcomes. Paul Trafurka is a dear colleague, and he wrote something called the Climbing the Ladder of Awareness, Five Stages of Awakening. And uh, his website, paultrafurka.ca. Dead asleep, awareness of one fundamental problem, awareness of many problems, awareness of the interconnections between the many problems, and awareness that our predicament encompasses all aspects of life. So I'm going to share a couple of paragraphs that he's written for each of these. They're, they're that good dead asleep. Problems? Problems? What problems? The only problem is what we're focusing on and telling ourselves. It's all still mostly good and getting better. Hey, just look at technology. You can't stop progress. At this stage, there seem to be no fundamental problems, just shortcomings in human organization, behavior, and morality that can be fixed with the proper attention to rulemaking. People at this stage tend to live their lives happily, with occasional outbursts of annoyance around election times or the quarterly corporate earnings seasons. Awareness of one fundamental problem. Whether it's climate change, soil loss, overpopulation, peak oil, chemical pollution, oceanic overfishing, biodiversity collapse, corporatism, economic instability, or sociopolitical injustice, one problem seems to engage the attention completely. People at this stage tend to become ardent activists for their cause. They tend to be quite vocal about their particular issue, yet remain relatively blind to any others. Awareness of many problems. As people let in more evidence from different domains, the awareness of complexity begins to grow. At this point, a person worries about the prioritization of problems in terms of immediacy and degree of impact. People at this stage may become reluctant to acknowledge new problems. For example, someone who's committed to fighting for social justice and against climate change may not recognize the problem of resource depletion. They may feel that the problem space is already too complex, and the addition of any new concerns will only dilute the effort that needs to be focused on solving the highest priority problem. Awareness of the interconnections between the many problems. The realization that a solution in one domain may worsen a problem in another marks the beginning of large-scale system-level thinking. It also marks the transition from thinking of the situation in terms of a set of problems to thinking of it in terms of a predicament. 
At this point, the possibility that there may not be a solution begins to raise its head. People who arrive at this stage tend to withdraw into tight circles of like-minded people in order to trade insights and deepen their understanding of what's going on. These circles are necessarily small, both because personal dialogue is essential for this depth of exploration and because there just aren't very many people who have arrived at this level of understanding. Awareness that our predicament encompasses all aspects of life. This includes everything we do, how we do it, all our relations, and our treatment of the biosphere and the planet. With this realization, the floodgates open and no problem is exempt from consideration or acceptance. The very concept of a capital S solution is seen through and cast aside as a waste of effort. For those who arrive at stage five, there's real risk that depression will set in. After all, we've learned throughout our lives that our hope for tomorrow lies in our ability to solve problems today. When no amount of human cleverness appears able to solve our predicament, the possibility of hope can vanish like the light of a candle flame to be replaced by the suffocating darkness of despair. And remember, these is the, this is the ladder of awareness. Awareness is hell. Only acceptance leading to trust is transformative. And this maps my trajectory exactly. And from 1987 until 2000, I had a deep ecological, bioregional, permaculture, eco-feminist perspective. But then in 2000, I read several books that put me on a techno-optimist, sort of human-centered understanding. And so I was dead asleep from 2000 to 2012. On December 3rd of 2012, Connie and I watched David Roberts' TEDx talk, Climate Change is Simple, the remix. And it changed my life. 2013, awareness of many problems. 2014, awareness of the interconnections between the many problems. And 2015 is when I read William Catton's book, Overshoot, and became aware that our predicament encompasses all aspects of life. And I was quite the activist in 2013, 2014. My wife and I both were. And then over the last 10 years, uh, and like 12,000 hours of reading, I've audio recorded dozens of books, hundreds of articles on abrupt climate change. That's like 10,000 years of climate change in half a human lifetime. Ecological overshoot, the rise and fall of civilizations, and how to adapt and thrive in that context, in the worst of circumstances. So that's what I've spent my life doing this last decade. And uh, I've actually recorded, I've read, I think, 15 of John Michael Greer's books, but I've recorded uh, 10 of them. And so here are some of John Michael Greer's best books. The last two there, After Progress and Dark Age America, you'll see that I, I'm an endorser on the back cover or uh, on the inside. In fact, I'm the official audio narrator for Dark Age America. And Greer uses, uh, uh, I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with Clue, the old game. There's actually depending upon when you might have played it. There's lots of versions over the last 50 years. But Greer uses the board game Clue as a metaphor for why it's both pointless and needlessly self-tormenting to worry about when and exactly how biospheric and civilizational collapse, already well underway, will affect one's day-to-day -day living. Will Mr. Body's killer turn out to be Colonel Mustard in the library with a lead pipe? Professor Plum in the conservatory with a candlestick, or Miss Scarlet in the dining room with a rope. Greer goes on to note that given the multi-causal, out-of-control nature of our predicament, ecological overshoot, peak oil, resource depletion, climate disruption, political corruption, cultural unraveling, and so forth, the already accelerating collapse of industrial civilization is overdetermined. And here's his quote. It's as though Colonel Mustard, Professor Plum, Miss Scarlet, and the rest of them all ganged up on Mr. Body at once, and only the most careful autopsy will be able to determine which of them actually dealt the fatal blow. I love this quote from Richard Heinberg. Our fundamental problem is not climate change. It is overshoot, of which global warming is a symptom. We have already overshot a, a dozen planetary boundaries. And even if we could somehow solve climate, which we can't, but even if we could, 
there are half a dozen or more other planetary boundaries that we have already overshot, and several of them are extinction level. So let me take a deep breath, and I invite you to do the same. The big picture, the first denial are us, understanding the nature of our predicament. First of all, denial often gets a bad rap. Denial is the largely unconscious habit of thought whereby we refuse to accept the reality of things that are bad or upsetting or that challenge our worldview, our legacy, how we live, what is required of us, and or our feelings of self-worth or superiority. Denial is also the instinctual impulse to reject or discount information that calls into question our hopes, assumptions, or expectations about the future. We all have denial instincts. I do, you do, everybody that we know and love does so we can have compassion for ourselves and for each other. Adaptive inattention is the way that I like to refer to it. I love this quote from Stephen Jenkinson. Inattention, that is not paying attention to the world's ecological state, is well advised because attention to it mitigates against your happiness, your contentment, and your sense of well-being. Having a conscience now is a grief-soaked proposition. Whatever spiritual awakening may have meant in past times and places, if you awaken in our time, you awaken with a sob. I've heard of denial. I just don't believe in it. Our extended forecast includes global warming and the catastrophic end of the human race. But for the weekend, it's looking like sunny skies, mild temperatures, and a general apathy toward environmental concerns. Back to you, Jim. It's not denial. I'm just very selective about the reality I accept. And who of us can't relate to this? My desire to be well-informed is currently at odds with my desire to remain sane. There have been several really important books in recent years that have, or recent decades, that have attempted to understand why is denial so, uh, so common, so universal among especially civilized types. So these three books are excellent. The fact that we're not getting our needs met in human-centered anthropocentric civilizations is really the root app of it. We're like caged animals. So these, I got this list from Dave Pollard, and these are universal needs in all cultures, in all societies, throughout, throughout all time. These are our basic needs. Habitable climate and healthy, non-toxic air, water, food, and shelter. The need to belong to and connect with a safe and engaging community, starting with attachment to one's mother in the critical first years of life. The need for meaning and purpose in one's life, including meaningful work. The need to be valued, appreciated, and heard. The need to feel secure about the future for oneself and loved ones. The need for control and a degree of autonomy over one's life and work. The need to be in regular intimate communion with the living world. The need for a sense of place and home. And the need for freedom from chronic stress, financial, physical, etc., and the time and space to recover from it, including getting adequate sleep. Now, the first thing to notice about this list is that these needs were met in spades in most pro-future indigenous, truly indigenous cultures. And most of these are not met in anthropocentric civilizations and certainly not met in industrial civilization. And so we all exhibit the kind of dysfunction that Paul Shepard used to talk about, this, this psychosis, because we are living in a situation that's unnatural to our species and what, our, and what evolution prepared us for. It is difficult to get a person to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. Many of us are familiar with this Upton Sinclair quote. I've extended it and expanded it. It's nearly impossible to get someone to understand what is collapsing their world and creating hell on earth when the answer is their own civilization. That is painful, and that's the truth. 
So denial are us. So what are we in denial of? Well, most of us, runaway collapse, the, the fact that collapse is, is already unstoppable, and that human-centered civilizations always create ecocide. So before I go further, I encourage you, this is a long program. So I'm going to, three times, I'm going to encourage you to stop, turn it off, stretch, pause, breathe, and then come back and fasten your seatbelt. So collapse. Many people think of collapse like the collapse of a building. No, collapse of ecosystems, collapse of civilizations are a different thing. Collapse is when a gradual downward trend in biophysical health and well-being goes into unstoppable decline, runaway, out of control, such as abrupt climate change, like 10,000 years of climate change in half a human lifetime. And as I shared in the shorter version of this program, you're not going to understand that many of the redwood forests out west are in collapse if you don't understand this, because most of the trees, most of these redwood trees are only producing cones where they're being artificially watered. So you have to have the eyes to see that these are ecosystems in collapse. Here's a civilization. Here's a visual image of industrial civilization collapsing. Again, going from a gradual downward trend into out of control decline, runaway, unstoppable. This is the great acceleration I've added of biospheric collapse. This is 73 years ago, 1950, and 23 years ago, 2000. And by every single measure, there's not a single system that human beings depend upon that isn't just in decline, but it's in precipitous, unstoppable, runaway freefall. It's known as the Great Acceleration, but if you Google Great Acceleration, you'll find all these charts that show socioeconomic trends, you know, world population, large dams, water use, transportation, international tourism, and so forth, and everything's going up. And it gives you the impression that, well, things are getting better. And then earth system trends, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, ocean acidification, and so forth. These, these are wrongly labeled. Because on the left, these are ecocidal trends. And on the right are measures of earth system collapse. They shouldn't be going up. The way our brains work, we naturally think of going up means better. No. So I've, I've inverted this just to help us understand and get and feel emotionally what's really the case. Because Gaia, the biospheric health, has been in decline for centuries and an unstoppable collapse for two to seven decades. Again, there's 2000 and 1950, 73 years ago and 23 years ago. And this is the great acceleration of biospheric collapse. The climate, the Holocene stability that allowed for civilization uh, and growing grain to even be possible, we've lost. It's now going bye-bye. Carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ice. We're losing all the ice of the world, the Arctic sea ice, Greenland, Antarctica, mountain glaciers. The oceans, we're losing the plankton, the corals, fish, ocean acidification, oceanic dead zones, and so forth, ocean sea rise. Soil, the amount of soil, the fertility of the soil, the moisture, permafrost, all the methane that's coming out that's now unstoppable. And then the mass extinction that we're in the midst of and causing, and only one mass extinction in the previous six or eight or however you want to count them, but only once have we lost the insects in the forest. And we're now adding carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide faster than then. So here's the painful fact that no matter how massive and effective is nonviolent civil disobedience, no matter who or which party is elected into or voted out of public office, no matter how many people change their habits, become vegan, stop flying, whatever, no matter how many supposedly game-changing artificial intelligence, high-tech solutions are tried, no matter how much evolution of consciousness occurs in the next decade or two, no matter how aggressively we try to shift to so-called renewables or net zero emissions, no matter how many psychopathic or sociopathic CEOs and bankers are imprisoned, and no matter how many accords, what is pledged or agreed to, what laws are enacted, and that last one, we've got a lot of evidence that we are already two to three decades into abrupt runaway and exponentially accelerating climate mayhem. And don't take my word on it. 
Here's a view of all of our cops, all of our conference on the parties over the course of the last 30 years, right? Our summits, our agreements, our promises, our pledges are worse than meaningless. And the reason they're worse than meaningless is because they give us the delusion that we're making progress when the actual opposite is the case. For example, during the 1960s, carbon parts per million was rising at 0.9 parts per million per year. In the 1970s, 1.3 parts per million per year. In the 1980s and 90s, one and a half parts per million per year. In the 2000s, two parts per million per year. In the 2010s, 2.4 parts per million per year. And just last month, COP27 in Egypt, right? November of 2022, right? Right there. The projection now is between 2.8 and three parts per million per year throughout the 2020s. See, it's rising. It's actually getting faster. That's what it means to have abrupt runaway and exponentially accelerating climate change. And that's just the CO2. When you look at nitrous oxide and methane, it's actually much, much worse. Here's where carbon parts per million were in May of 2022, that's this year, 422 parts per million. And this chart is over the last 800,000 years. You can see these are the peak glacials when the ice was the thickest in the Northern hemisphere. The ice age average was 200 parts per million. The pre-industrial average was 280 parts per million. That's ideal for agriculture. Agriculture and civilizational collapse become unstoppable at about 360 parts per million. That's why 350.org is all about trying to get down to 350, which is not going to happen. And climate stability needed for agriculture and civilization is between 280 and 360. So we talk about climate change, but it's really abrupt, runaway, and irreversible climate, not just change, but mayhem. Because here's where we are now. In May of 2022, this year, carbon dioxide equivalent, that is carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane, the three of them together, were over 500 parts per million in carbon dioxide equivalent. And so Here's a chart of the last 400,000 years. We see carbon dioxide, global temperature, and sea level all rising and falling in lockstep. Sometimes one of them leads, sometimes another one leads, but they all rise and fall in lockstep. And here's where we are now. So it's only a matter of time before both global temperature and sea level rises considerably. So no matter what, these extinction-level tipping points are already in the rearview mirror. That's what's meant by unstoppable collapse. The loss of the world's ice. In fact, there have been several major books. Henry Pollock's actually a neighbor. He lives here in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, A World Without Ice, back in 2010. Peter Wadhams, one of the top scientists in the world on this subject, A Farewell to Ice, a report from the Arctic, and one of the best books that's ever been written on climate change, in my opinion, Dar Jamel, The End of Ice. Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption. In fact, if you only read one book on climate change, I'd encourage you to read that one. Turns out that when most of the Arctic ice is gone, the serious global warming begins. And I'm not going to talk about this. Just Google phase change and latent heat. You'll find all that you want to know. Methane belching from the permafrost, methane hydrates, methane clathrates, oil and gas wells, millions of oil and gas wells are, are releasing methane. Wetlands, it turns out, there was a major paper just this year on this subject. This, these are in unstoppable mode. Ocean acidification, ocean deoxygenation, that is loss of oxygen, and at least 25 feet of abrupt nonlinear sea level rise. And that's what John Englander, the former president of the Jacques Cousteau Society, has said that even if every human being went extinct tonight, if we all died from some virus, the seas would continue to rise at least 25 to 40 feet over the next 150 years. The great conflagration of the world's forest. That is, the, the world's forests are already in unstoppable runaway burning. It's out of control. Even if we could somehow miraculously stop human emissions, Carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide would continue to rise even if we didn't have any humans because of the great burning of the world's forests. The loss of most species, animal and plant, on land and in lakes, rivers, and oceans. And then increasingly severe and deadly weather 
storms, floods, droughts, hurricanes. And yes, I totally get this is repulsive. This is unacceptable. That's why denial is so universal. And we're not uniquely evil. We are not uniquely stupid. That that's what human-centered civilizations do is they create ecocide. It's just we're doing it on a global scale. Turns out that collapse and ecocide are built into the DNA of human-centered agricultural city-based civilizations. These quotes are sobering. Forests precede civilizations and deserts follow them. All of our exalted technological progress, civilization for that matter, is comparable to an ax in the hand of a pathological criminal. Civilization is a hopeless race to discover remedies for the evils it produces. The end of the human race will be that it will eventually die of civilization. And the earth is littered with the ruins of empires and civilizations that once believed they were eternal. And that last one is not an exaggeration. And these are heavyweight quotes. A few years ago, the BBC had a... Uh, Deep Civilization series had an article by Luke Kemp titled, Are We on the Road to Civilizational Collapse? And of course, he answered yes, because it turns out that collapse is a feature of all human-centered civilizations. It's not a bug. It's a feature. He had this chart of 88 ancient civilizations, just between 3,000 before the Common Era and 1,000 of the Common Era, just that 4,000-year period. If you go back before 3,000 BCE, or if you look at the last 1,000 years, we're talking well over 100 civilizations. And as the famous 20th century historian Arnold Toynbee said, great civilizations are not murdered. They take their own lives. And turns out we know how. Here's how human-centered civilizations commit suicide, commit ecocide. And this is the last 5% of human history, the last 8,000 years. 400 generations. Typically, this takes between 225 and 325 years. There are exceptions, but that's the average. And there are more than 80 examples. We see progress, rise, boom, at least for the elites and ruling class, obviously not for the slaves. This entire process is ecological overshooting of carrying capacity. And then once we've tipped over, we see regress, fall, bust. And this becomes an unstoppable process of collapse. There's not in all of human history any example ever of a civilization becoming sustainable on the way down. It can't happen for very well-known reasons. And our inner world of feelings and expectations, it matters when you're born and when you die. For example, if you're born and you die in times of progress and expansion, well, of course, you expect your kids and grandkids are going to have it better than you. It's just kind of the way things are. If you're born and die in times of decline and fall, in times of collapse, in times of regress, not progress, well, of course, your kids and grandkids are going to have it more difficult. That's just the way things are. It's when you're born in times of expansion and it shifts in your lifetime. Until you accept it, that's hell. That's doom. That's where hope, fear, back and forth, hope, fear, hope, fear, hope, fear, and depression. What I'm calling post-doom, no gloom can only come with acceptance. Acceptance of what? Well, acceptance of the unstoppable nature of civilizational collapse. And in our case, also biospheric collapse. And again, there's more than 80 examples. William Ophels is one of my intellectual mentors, uh, right up there with William Catton. And this little 75-page book, Immoderate Greatness, Why Civilizations Fail, 75 pages, he takes an entire library of research on the collapse of civilizations and sums it up in little 75 page book. It's amazing. I've recorded the entire audio of the thing. It's up on SoundCloud. And then his most recent book, I just actually recorded it last week, Electrifying the Titanic, the Shipwreck of Industrial Civilization. And then Apologies to the Grandchildren. Here's how he begins Apologies to the Grandchildren. This is the, the very first paragraph. Civilization is, by its very nature, a long-running Ponzi scheme. It lives by robbing nature and borrowing from the future, exploiting its hinterland until there's nothing left to exploit, after which it implodes. While it still lives, it generates a temporary and fictitious surplus that it uses to enrich and empower the few 
and to dispossess and dominate the many. Industrial civilization is the apotheosis and quintessence of this fatal course. A fortunate minority gains luxuries and freedoms galore, but only by slaughtering, poisoning, and exhausting creation. I've recorded all of those books, by the way. We need to untrivialize. I suggest that we would do well to untrivialize or realize moral language. And yes, I'm talking about good and evil. Good and evil are not merely relative. They're not merely context dependent. In all healthy cultures, in all traditional societies, good and evil have always applied to ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. Good is what encourages or supports or enriches ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. Evil is what diminishes or destroys or degrades ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness, usually in that order. So it turns out that denial and hope lead good people with the best of intentions to unwittingly ensure geological scale evil. There are 440, maybe more now, nuclear reactors worldwide requiring us to assume that industrial civilization has eternal life. Yet we're already 25 to 30 years into abrupt runaway climate mayhem. So here's the 64 million year question. Those of you that are old enough to remember the $64 million question, right? Here's the 64 million year question. As industrial civilization continues to collapse faster and faster, how many Chernobyl or Fukushima-like or worse meltdowns due to wildfires, hurricanes, droughts, tsunamis, power grid failures, political instability, or terrorism do you think are possible, likely, inevitable? Most people, most average people, they don't know what ecological overshoot of carrying capacity means. It means taking too much in terms of resources and exuding too much in terms of waste so that the natural systems break down. But here are, the, here are the ways it shows up, okay? Here are the different symptoms of ecological overshoot. Climate mayhem, the death of the oceans, plant and animal annihilation, topsoil poisoning and loss, critical resource depletion, chemical and nuclear wastes, the growing gulf between the rich and the poor, economic instability and insanity, political polarization and conflict, the contracting of in-groups, and the rise of totalitarianism and other isms. See, these active, we activists often focus on these, and understandably so, but these are all symptoms of ecological overshoot of carrying capacity. They're not the problem. And these first three are in extinction level runaway mode. So I go into great depths. These are my two most, <laughs> these are the only two videos I've ever created that actually went viral sort of uh, for the first 15 days that I put them up on YouTube, like 10,000 new people every day watch them, close to 200,000 views now. But collapse in a nutshell and overshoot in a nutshell. And I encourage you to check those out. Those are my attempt to create a <laughs> collapse for dummies. Uh, <laughs> I love this. You got hopium, right? What do I mean by hopium? Right? Here's a simple definition of hopium. Hopium is a comforting vision of the future that requires breaking the laws of physics, biology, or ecology. Hopium is irrational or unwarranted optimism that promises short-term relief, but delivers crushing disappointment and despair when reality inevitably bites. And hopium is believing that the climate crisis can be fixed or solved by doubling down on the very things driving ecocide in the first place. And as I mentioned already, hopium leads good people to unnecessarily suffer and to unknowingly increase the likelihood of excessive nuclear meltdowns and species extinctions. I mean, there's going to be some nuclear meltdowns. There's going to be lots of species extinction. But if we can break free of hopium addiction, we can perhaps, possibly alleviate by shutting some of the nukes down and by helping trees move, as I'll talk about in a few minutes. So the most vulnerable populations for hopium are young people who expect a life like their parents or grandparents had, high schoolers agonizing whether college and college debt is worth it, couples trying to decide on marriage or whether to become parents, Parents of young children or teenagers still living at home. Older generations who are terrified or consumed with guilt 
when considering the world their adult children and grandchildren will inherit. This is a potent quote from Hannah Arendt. Hope is a dangerous barrier to acting courageously in dark times. In hope, the soul overleaps reality as in fear it shrinks back from it. So I've already mentioned that the most important book, in fact, I say this on all my videos, the most important book I've ever read in my life by far is William Catton's book, Overshoot. Ecological Basis of Revolutionary Change. I've recorded the audio of that as well, the audio book. It's all available up on SoundCloud. Here's a powerful quote. Humanity is locked into stealing ravenously from the future. That is what this book is about. A major aim is to show that commonly proposed solutions for problems confronting us are actually going to aggravate those problems. In order to truly understand our predicament and not make things worse, we need a clear-headed ecological interpretation of history. And that middle one there, that commonly proposed solutions are going to make things worse, that's, that's core. Because ecological understanding of the human predicament indicates that we live in times when the habit of asking, all right, now what must we do about it, must be replaced with a different query that does not assume that all problems are soluble. What must we avoid doing? to keep from making a bad situation unnecessarily worse. For example, here are some climate solutions. These are being sold to us by the IPCC and New York Times bestselling authors and just virtually everybody, the media. These are climate solutions that actually make things worse. These are all hopium. Renewables, nuclear, wind and solar, fusion, space colonization, Carbon taxation, tar carbon credits, biofuels, super batteries, carbon sequestration, green economy, electric cars. The reason that these things make things worse is because they all exacerbate and extend ecological overshoot. And each one requires the four main drivers of collapse and ecocide to persist. I did one of the most recent videos I did was titled The Main Drivers of Collapse, Ecocide, and Likely Near Term Human Extinction. Here I see is the four main things driving it. The first is extractive, exploitative civilizations themselves. Science and technology, for example, electricity. You see all this emphasis, on, especially within the uh, activist world and environmentalists of trying to get from non-renewable energy to so-called renewable energy. No, the problem is electricity. It's not how you generate the electricity. If you look at a chart of the electrification of the world and Ecocide, they go hand in hand. They're just perfectly parallel. What gets called progress in development is a driver of ecocide and money-based growth economics. These are the four main drivers of collapse ecocide and likely near-term human extinction. And undergirding all four of those, there's one ultimate cause, which is anthropocentrism or human-centeredness. Again, I do a whole program on this. It's 40 minutes long. This just came out this last week, Global Warming in the Pipeline. James Hansen and 14 or 15 co-authors. Here's their bottom line, that extinction level overheating is already in the pipeline. 10 degrees Celsius, that's 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Global average temperature rise is already baked in, and that's not going to be evenly distributed. It's going to be worse in the Arctic. 18 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius, already baked in? And the amazing thing is, if you look at the commentary on the internet about this, it's just insane. People are saying, well, we need to get geoengineering in there. No, <laughs> that's what's driving it in the first place. We are toast. And even if we weren't, these are four deadly accurate metaphors. The first is that homo colossus, that is industrial humanity, has stage four lung cancer. And arguing for green technology or an energy transition is like believing that organic cigarettes can restore health and win the fight against death. Another accurate metaphor, the global economy is a parasitic superorganism. This parasitic superorganism is now entering its death throes because it's exhausted its host, Gaia, and its own financial creativity such that it cannot continue growing which is a prerequisite for its survival. 
Industrial civilization is a demon devouring the living world and creating hell on earth. Those who advocate for so-called renewables, clean energy, or a green new deal are actually proposing strategies to keep the demon on life support. And I love this. This is a potent one, this last one. Our rapacious civilization is a serial killer, a mass murderer. Advocating for geoengineering and or widespread electrification is akin to doing everything in our power to ensure that the killer has a long and prosperous career while providing a lifetime stay-out-of-jail-free card. So I know this feels like I'm beating a dead horse, but again, the whole purpose of this program is to help people truly accept what is unstoppable and inescapably real. So what's wrong with hope? Like, why not let people believe whatever they want if it helps them get through their day without depression and despair? Well, it turns out that one of the main causes of depression and despair is hope. That's the thing that most people don't get. And personally, I said before, only acceptance transforms lives, the quality of our time remaining, the quality of your relationships, the quality of your contribution. If you think you've got decades, if you think we've got decades, you're going to put off this stuff. If you realize this could be your last decade and potentially the last decade of everybody you know and love, you're going to attend to things like people do when they are diagnosed with a terminal illness. And societally, the anger and passion of youth is, should be channeled for good, not evil. We need a critical mass of acceptance that's needed for collective action regarding these things, avoiding the ionization of the atmosphere and the 90% or more loss of surface life, which will actually happen, inevitably happen if we have lots of nuclear meltdowns, which we're going to do if we're in denial, if we have hope. The long-term toxicity, frugal use of resources, reducing suffering, and improving the odds of avoiding the extinction of at least some plants and animal species. Crit critical acceptance is needed for that. So that's what's wrong with hope. So in light of all that, calm gratitude at Teotihuacan? Really? Well, that's what the rest of this program is about, is that acceptance is the key. There is no calm gratitude in these crazy, insane times, this collapsing time, if we don't have acceptance and ultimately leading to trust. So that's the key. So I encourage you to pause, turn it off, take a break, breathe, surely breathe, uh, move, you know, stretch, whatever. If you need to pour yourself a stiff one, go for it, you know, or, or if you identify with Kate DiBiaschi, uh, Jennifer Lawrence character in Don't Look Up when she says, I got to go get high, right? I get it. So calm gratitude at Teotihuacan, like really? I suggest that acceptance of 10 certainties is vital for calm gratitude. These are things that are unstoppable. These are, these are inevitable. Uh, in fact, I did three programs with the same title, basically an appetizer version, 10 inevitables, a little 33 minute introduction a quick nourishing meal of almost 50 minute uh, introduction, and then the full course meal, the all you can eat buffet, two hours, uh, six course gourmet meal, six 20 minute servings. I encourage people to stop after each 20 minutes. And really, if, if you only watch one video beyond this one you're watching now, I recommend this one. It's 12,000 hours, 10 years of research compressed into one video. It was my attempt to take all the important stuff I've learned over the last decade and put it into one video. And here are just briefly, I'm just going to list these. I'm not going to discuss them, but here are 10 certainties that if you resist or deny or resent these, you're not going to have calm gratitude at Teotihuacan. The first is that most people will have a hard time trusting how and why our civilization is collapsing. It's certain that abrupt climate change, that is a rapid one and a half or more uh, Celsius uh, uh, temperature rise, locks in biospheric collapse and extinctions. Tipping points already crossed will be falsely framed as still avoidable. Without assisted migration, love, and action, most tree species will go extinct. 
without urgent collective action, there will be dozens, maybe hundreds of nuclear meltdowns. As our biospheric and societal predicament worsens, so will our mental health. Now, this isn't every individual because actually with acceptance, your mental health can be significantly improved, but this is the average. This is generally what happens in times of collapse. Plato noted uh, 2,500 years ago that as civilization, and he only knew about a couple, but as civilizations contract and collapse, addictions and mental health issues of all kinds ramp up. Most people will only reluctantly relinquish their faith in the almighty we. Let me say something about that. I love this one. It's not too late to stop the worst of climate change if we all accept reality and work together for the common good. And that's the key phrase. If we all. <laughs> We're fucked. The almighty we is a secular religious faith in omnipotent human agency. You know how you read a, you read a book, a great book, nine chapters of doom, and then the last chapter is the happy chapter. Or if we all just do this, right? And here are some examples of the hubris of the almighty we. Progress and development. Biosphere management. Climate restoration. Geoengineering. Global scale mobilization. The evolution of consciousness. Global degrowth revolution. Species level awakening. Or social tipping points. I suggest that all of these are actually the hubris of the almighty we. If you proselytize only the doom side of collapse reality, expect to be shunned. Most people will crave distraction and virtually anything that offers hope. And where there are addicts, there will be dealers. Elite universities, the IPCC, mainstream media, politicians, New York Times bestselling authors will remain first-rate legal hopium dealers. And I've done three programs, Hopium Detox and Recovery, Accepting and Trusting Unstoppable Collapse. I just did this math this past May. Doubt on McPherson. And then Hopium Dealers Hall of Fame with a nod to Guy McPherson. So if you're interested in this Hopium theme, uh, definitely check these out. So this is meant tongue-in-cheek. This is sort of reverse psychology. But before I talk about... Uh, how to have calm gratitude at Tiatawaki, how to maximize misery, have to, how to be so miserable that you've got plenty to share with others, how, how to maximize misery at Tiatawaki. The first is to whine and complain about how unfair it all is and condemn those that you judge as responsible for your and our difficulties. You got to do that if you're going to be miserable. Cling to faith and progress believing that we are the most evolved or advanced creatures and that our brains, the most complex organ in the cosmos, insist that we can, if we all, condemn pessimistic doomists and angrily demand justice for all those oppressed by colonial systems of exploitation. Pretend that we're not in runaway collapse and put faith in hopium technofix solutions touted by the IPCC, media experts, best-selling authors, and so forth. This is also important if you're going to maximize misery. Do as much doom-scrolling and or desperate hope-seeking as possible while privately, secretively wallowing in grief, anxiety, fear, depression, or despair. And then spend most of your time indoors viewing screens and as little time as possible outdoors, mesmerized by life, and in deep communion with God. And yes, G Earth Emoji D. If it's not obvious what that means, I've done several uh, much longer e in detail programs. God owning our error, accepting our fate. Sustainability 101, indigenuity is not optional. Little short video, my God, what have we done? That's actually one of my best ones, I think. That's what the co-pilot of the Enola Gay that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima said. My God, what have we done? And then my most recent video, Collapse and Ecocide as Religious Failure. God blind, biosphere deaf. What I'm meaning by the word God, G, Earth emoji, D, is reality with a personality. Remember the quote from Loyal Rue at the beginning in terms of, you know, the most important insight is 
to live in right relationship to reality? Well, God, G earth emoji D, that's what I'm meaning. Reality with a personality, not a person outside reality. I'm a religious naturalist. I'm a sacred realist. We take nature to heart, but we don't call our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end merely nature, or at least I don't. So ecology is the heart of my theology. I have an eco-theo worldview. In fact, I suggest that virtually all truly sustainable cultures had an eco-theo worldview. I go into that in great depth in Sustainability 101. Here's my credo, my eco-theo credo. Again, I'm a religious naturalist or a sacred realist. This is my, my religious worldview in a nutshell. Reality is my God. Evidence is my scripture. The epic of evolution is my creation story. Ecology is my theology. Integrity is my spiritual path. And evangelizing right relationship to reality is my mission. And by evangelizing, I simply mean sharing the good news, that it's great news to come into right relationship to reality. And, and where I ground this in is both in terms of loyal rule, but also the four R's of right relationship to reality. According to indigenous elder, plant scientist, and New York Times bestselling author, Robin Wall Kimmerer, she calls these the four R's of right relationship to reality. Respect, responsibility, reciprocity, and reverence. I could do a whole program on these. In fact, I actually did the Sustainability 101. But we're not going to have respect, responsibility, reciprocity, or reverence for something that we consider an it rather than a thou to be honored and respected. If we just think of earth as an it to be exploited, as a, a larder and a toilet, we're sunk. Joseph Brodsky won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1987, and he was a Russian polymath who taught at some of the top universities in the United States and Canada. And he famously said, you Americans are so naive. You think evil is going to come into your houses wearing big black boots. It doesn't happen like that. Look at the language. It begins in the language. And what does he mean by evil coming in in the language? Well, here's the way many people, most people, speak about our predicament. We are at risk of civilizational collapse. We need to declare a climate emergency. Without fill in the blank, we're doomed. Our time is a great awakening, a great turning, a great transition. The window of opportunity for bold action is closing. Green technology, green capitalism can reverse climate change. Evolution means progress. There are solutions. Now is the time to act. The situation is dire. How these kinds of concepts actually encourage good people to do evil is that it provides hope. It provides hopium that prevents us from acting in terms of like capping the nukes and moving trees and things like that. The situation isn't dire. The situation's over, as was captured in HBO's The Newsroom 2014 EPA segment. It's probably the most accurate portrayal on American TV ever of what climate scientists actually know but never say. The news anchor asked the top scientists at uh, EPA, so it sounds like you're saying the situation is dire. And the scientist says, no, not exactly. Your house is burning to the ground. The situation is dire. Your house has already burned to the ground. The situation is over. And then about a month later, Mother Jones did a fact check on Aaron Sorkin, who was the writer of the newsroom, uh, on the science and concluded, he's right. We're toast. Look at the description box for the full eight-minute clip. I've got the link there. There's another important place where evil comes in in the language. One of my intellectual mentors was Wittgenstein. He said, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Because here's the thing. Your God is whatever you put your faith or trust in, your ultimate concern. If technology or the market is your ultimate concern, is that where you put your faith or trust? Then that's your God. And this isn't just Michael Dowd saying this, arguably the most influential theologian of the 20th century, Paul Tillich, famously identified faith as our ultimate concern. What do we surrender to? Right? If we're not surrendered to that, whatever our name for that reality, but that is our biophysical, our universal creator, sustainer, and end. If that's not our ultimate commitment, if that's not what we put our faith and trust in, we're sunk. And yet our name for that reality either evokes hubris or humility. 
whether we refer to that reality as the environment or God, G Earth emoji D, makes a huge difference. It's, it either evokes hubris or humility. And any notion of God that doesn't include our biophysical creator, sustainer, end is an ecocidal notion of the divine. You could call this a fundamental law of life, relate to the larger body of life as divine or perish. Or a more indigenous way of saying it, relate to the community of life as kin or perish. In fact, I love this quote from indigenous elder Daniel Wildcat. We live among relatives, not resources. And my mentor, Thomas Berry, said something similar. He said, the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. The environment, after all, is not our surroundings. It is our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end. So one of my favorite movies is Don't Look Up. I've seen it at least two dozen times. It's the best example of gallows humor. In fact, a litmus test of whether you are accepting what I'm talking about in this program or not is how you experience this movie. If you don't laugh your ass off, you don't get it. You're not an acceptance. <laughs> I love what Neil deGrasse Tyson said. He said, I finally saw the Netflix film, Don't Look Up, a fictional tale of a nation distracted by pop culture and divided on whether to heed dire warnings of scientists. Everything I know about news cycles, talk shows, social media, and politics tells me the film was instead a documentary. Because here's the, here's the painful truth until you accept it. A comet actually is heading our way. We ourselves set it in motion millennia ago. But only recently have scientists echoing long-standing indigenous warnings charted its course and voiced the alarm. Its name is anthropocentrism. In religious language, in mythic language, idolatry. And these are the end times because human-centeredness, as opposed to God-centeredness or life-centeredness, will prove to be just as unstoppable and nearly as deadly as the comet in the movie. To be clear, what's a God's eye view of the world? From an eco-theo perspective, it's not just the view from above and outside at all, like the view that looks at a galaxy from the outside. No, that's a human-centered understanding. This is a God's eye view of the universe, a God's eye view of the world. The view from within every set of eyes, the subjective experience of every creature is literally a God's eye view. And I'm talking about God, G Earth emoji D, not as any being to believe in. It's, it's, it's reality with a personality. We haven't been living that way, however. And this quote is potent. Robert Louis Stevenson, sooner or later, we all sit down to a banquet of consequences. That's the great reckoning. And it's unstoppable. And it's not because some supernatural being is pissed off at us. It's because we've been living out of right relationship to reality. And we're now about to experience and are already experiencing the consequences. However, I believe it can also be the great homecoming. Humanity, the prodigal species, after squandering our inheritance, coming awake in the predicament, in the pig pen, as it were, and coming home to God, to reality, to life. And that's true even if we go extinct, which is a very, very real possibility, even in this process of global hospice, because most of those creatures with the other eyes are going out, and each of those is a unique face of the divine, a unique face of God, G, Earth, Emoji, D. So finally getting to the point here, cultivating calm gratitude at the end of the world as we know it, Tiatawaki, because we may not be at the end of the world full stop but we are absolutely at the end of the world as we know it. The first is, is most important, which is to accept the four things I'm talking about. Denial is practically universal, that we're unstoppable collapse, that civilizations always lead to ecocide, and that we're in a time of global hospice. First of all, accepting those four things. Repenting of human centeredness and coming home to God. Now, this is obviously a religious thing to say. What the hell am I meaning by that? Well, repent simply means... To publicly admit, to admit to yourself and to others, I thought this was the truth. We thought this was the truth. And now we see this was diluted. And now I'm committed to this. That's simply what it means. It means to reject human centeredness and come home to life. Life as a greater thou, not merely a lesser it. Remember who and what you are. You are the universe becoming aware of itself that we're all, that we grow out of, and all other species do. We grow out of the planet in the same way that an apple grows out of an apple tree. And what you are, you're mortal. You're going to die. And we're going to die. 
all species go extinct and honor when and where you are. You are in a collapsing civilization. You are in a collapsing uh, time. We're not in times of expansion anymore. And where you are, your bioregion, fall in love with your bioregion. See this, remembering who and what you are and remembering uh, or honoring when and where you are. This is the whole epic of evolution. This is the universe story. This is the great story. And I do whole programs. Most of my life for the last 20 years has been about promoting that. Embracing your own mortality, embracing our mortality. Uh, Connie and I have a programs, many programs on death. Uh, it's the sacred side of death. I'll include in the, um, in the description box information on how to access that. But to simplify your life and commit to less, L-E-S-S. -S. I got that from John Michael Greer. Less energy, less stuff, less stimulation. And I added <laughs> less with a lisp. I added uh, another S because we can all be committed to less suffering, lessening the suffering of others. So simplify and commit to less energy, less stuff, less stimulation, and less suffering. Let go of judgmental blame, self-righteousness, and self-pity. This is vital for cultivating calm gratitude. You can let go because most of us are so judgmental. You know, if we choose not to fly, we judge those who fly. If we choose to not eat meat, we judge those who have meat. If we choose to not have children, we judge others that have children. No, let go of all that stuff. It's too late for that. Let go of the self-righteousness and the self-pity and the blame. Getting complete with everyone. All the important people in your life expressing care, gratitude, and regrets. Those three things, Just I, I actually created a list of all the people that have meant something to me that have been meaningful in my life. And I've just re been reaching out for expressing care, expressing gratitude to those people who've been a blessing to me. And those people, the few people that I've betrayed or harmed or had, had a negative impact on that I could remember, right? I've communicated regret. Contribute to the well being of others, human and more than human. And then to nurture awe, gratitude courage, compassion, and generosity. I think everybody is deserving of compassion and generosity, but here are some populations that I suggest are especially deserving of compassion and generosity. Poor people, communities, and nations who will suffer the most from climate and ecological breakdowns, yet contributed the least to its main causes. Those of us feeling the loneliness of having to navigate our own downshifting expectations, while it's family, friends, and maybe even spouses are in denial. Activists who believe that climate change is our main problem and that it can be solved or fixed by doubling down on the very drivers of collapse and ecocide. And individuals, couples, children, families, and communities of our fellow social and mammalian species who generally feel and suffer just like we do. A couple of years ago, I found this, what is globalization? That's when a woman in New York, a man in Hobart, a child in Oslo, a canary in Milan, an old lady in Peru, a dolphin off the coast of Madagascar, all share the same anxiety and the same despair for the same reason at the same time. I also believe that especially deserving of compassion and generosity are techno-optimists and free market fundamentalists who will remain in denial the longest and yet also be hardest hit emotionally and financially when reality bites. Religious, political, and social liberals and progressives whose religious faith in perpetual progress is currently being shaken, shattered, or abandoned. And I believe also deserving of compassion and generosity are religious conservatives and fundamentalists whose faith in scripture has blinded them to what reality God has revealed through evidence about our inner, outer, social, and mortal nature, and who thus struggle disproportionately with addiction, teen pregnancy, domestic violence, depression, suicide, and sin in general. Acceptance as the key to sanity and post-doom, no gloom, peace of mind. Awareness of ongoing unstoppable collapses hell. Only acceptance transforms lives. 
And by post-doom, no gloom, what I mean is that I, on my post-doom website, in two different places, I have three definitions of doom and three definitions of post-doom that I actually worked for about somewhere between eight and 12 months in terms of collective intelligence. I was getting the feedback of some of my friends and, and colleagues. Uh, so, but before we go there, I encourage you to stop, pause, breathe, right? stretch if you need to. Uh, seriously, this is a long program. Stop for just a couple minutes at least and just breathe and then come back. So definitions of doom and post-doom. It's on both those pages of the website. Doom is a normal feeling of disgust or dread upon realizing that technological progress and economic growth and development are the root of our predicament, not our way out. Doom is a name for the anxiety and fear called forth when living in a corrupt, dysfunctional civilization causing a mass extinction. And doom is the midpoint between denial and regeneration, with or without us. That's what life does. Life regenerates. We call it compost theology. Right? Life regenerates, with or without us. Post-doom. What opens up when we remember who we are and how we got here, accept the inevitable, honor our grief, and prioritize what is pro-future and soul-nourishing? Post-doom is a fierce and fearless reverence for life and expansive gratitude, even in the midst of abrupt climate mayhem and the runaway collapse of societal harmony, the health of the biosphere, and business as usual. And post-doom is living meaningfully, compassionately and courageously, no matter what. Again, I keep coming back to this theme that acceptance leading to trust is the key to sanity and post-doom, no gloom, peace of mind. In fact, I did two shorter videos, Beyond Hope and Fear, Clarity, Compassion, Courageous Love and Action, and then the New Serenity Prayer, Emotional Support for Climate Anxiety and Environmental Dread. And many of us are familiar with the Serenity Prayer. It was penned by Ronald Niebuhr in the 1960s. Uh, God, life, reality. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. A lot of us don't know this next line. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace. Decades ago, I read this book by Ann Wilson Schaaf, When Society Becomes an Addict, it was a New York Times bestseller. And this book, which I absolutely love, My Name is Jealous, and I'm in, in Recovery from Western Civilization, Jealous Glendening. And this is the more recent cover. And based on 12-step work, but this understanding of acceptance, in fact, this quote is actually comes from the, the, the AA Big Book. I've altered it just slightly. Acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I am disturbed, it's because I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some fact of my life, unacceptable to me. And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way it's supposed to be at this moment. Nothing, absolutely nothing, happens in God's world by mistake. Until I could accept my, whatever your addiction may be, in, our, in my case here, until I could accept my civilizational addiction, I could not stay sane nor sober. Unless I accept life completely on life's terms, I cannot be happy. I need to concentrate, not so much on what needs to be changed in the world, as on what needs to be changed in me and in my attitudes. And I've added this, and how I can be of service to others and faithful to God, faithful to life, faithful to reality because that's what sustainable means. Sustainable means faithful. Unsustainable means unfaithful. And I suggest that virtually everything else we say is either a distraction or misses the point. And here's the thing. It's way too late for civilization. Civilization is not going to become faithful, but it's not too late for you. It's not too late. Here are the things that we can change if we can. It's not too late to pursue ecological integrity, social coherence, 
and personal wholeness. Again, that's what is the core good. It's always good to do anything you can to promote ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. Any and everything you do, it's not too late for that. It's not too late to reduce suffering and to adapt to less energy, less stuff, and less stimulation. It's not too late to resist further destruction and evil. It's not too late to assist trees and other plants in migrating. I'm familiar with this because my wife is actually one of North America's leading point people on this field of assisted migration, assisting trees in migrating faster than any other animal can move their seeds. It doesn't require any funding, just any individual can do it. Zach St. George, an award-winning journalist, wrote a book a couple of years ago, The Journeys of Trees, a story about forests, people, and the future. That's the hardcover. Uh, my wife started an organization called Trey Guardians. Here's the soft cover, And it features my wife, Connie Barlow, from the very first sentence throughout this book. She did a, a video blog called Helping Force Walk. She got that term from Robin Wall Kimmerer. Go on the Wikipedia Assisted migration of forests to North America, and you can learn all about this entire field of assisted migration. I love this quote from Paul Hawken. There's a rabbinical teaching that says if you're told the world is ending and the Messiah has arrived, first plant a tree, then see if the story is true. It's not too late to support indigenous resistance. That's where biodiversity and the soil and the forests and the waters are being protected most fiercely is with indigenous leadership. It's not too late to be a blessing to friends, family, and community. It's not too late to be a loving person. And it's not too late to engage in regenerative, restorative love and action. Permaculture, agroecology, Indigenuity, regenerative agriculture, regenerative everything. It's, 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 not, it's partnering with nature rather than competing with it. It's protecting the soil rather than disturbing it. Promotes diversity rather than monoculture. It's holistic. And I've had four amazing uh, post-doom conversations with David Holmgren, Denise Rushing, Joe Brewer, Daniel Christian Wall. So if you're into regeneration or you just are curious, please take the time to watch these. They're, these are profoundly inspiring. It is too late, however, or was never possible in the first place. This is accepting what we cannot change. It's too late to change the narrative or to awaken enough people to transform social, political, and economic systems. It is too late to slow, stop, or reverse abrupt climate mayhem and the accelerating collapse of the biosphere and business as usual. It is too late to prevent the loss of most of the world's forests, ice, insects, coral reefs, and protective ozone layer. It is too late to spare Homo Colossus the ecocidal consequences of human ingenuity, technology, and the market. And it is too late to prevent billions of humans and other mammals and vertebrates from dying this decade or next. finding the gift, the benefits of acceptance, and trusting reality. Here's where history can serve as our teacher, staying positive and empowered in the worst of circumstances. Again, it starts with acceptance. Here are some of the benefits. These are just a few that I've outlined. The benefits of trusting what is inevitable. Post do no gloom, collapse acceptance. The first is that when you understand from an ecological and historical perspective, you gain clarity over confusion. All of a sudden, you're not confused and angry anymore. You realize, oh, of course, of course, of course. That's what my videos are trying to do is try to help people have that knowledge so they can relax and have clarity over confusion, compassion over blame, and love and action over futility, over desperate activism. One of the other benefits is that it reprioritizes nearly everything around what matters most and what really doesn't. Most people gain a calm urgency to get complete with self, family, others, life, and your contribution, your legacy. It focuses attention on home, family, community, what's local, what's joyful, 
what's meaningful. And you'll probably notice that these are the kind of benefits that come if somebody's given a terminal diagnosis. They can fight it, in which case they don't get any of these benefits, or they can accept it. And this is these are the kinds of benefits that, that come. Freedom from shoulds, oughts, have tos, and freedom for coulds, might, get tos. Most people experience an overwhelming gratitude simply for the gift of being alive, aware, and able to feel deeply, including grief. And yes, I realize that if you're low on the Maslow's hierarchy and you don't know where you're going to get food next week, or you know, you're struggling to even stay warm, that you know, those are those are foundational. I get that. But still, there are always things that we can be grateful for. And an expanded sense of self that identity that Alan Watts used to call it the skin encapsulated ego. No, it's expanded self of yourself, your identity and of impermanence and death as sacred, as holy, as meaningful, as inspiring. Karen Perry, one of my closest colleagues, uh, we did a post doom conversation on the topic of 15 benefits of collapse acceptance. And make sure that you look at the YouTube description box because she has a couple of things she's written on this topic of the benefits of collapse acceptance. Because as I've said before, collapse awareness is hell. Only acceptance transforms lives. Her husband, Jordan Perry, 14 post-doom actions. Excellent. And then David Baum on his uh, collapse club, getting real about collapse, interviews both of them. And then Meg Wheatley, one of my closest colleagues in this great work is Margaret Wheatley, Meg Wheatley, Beyond Hope and Fear, a conversation I just had with her two months ago. And there are two others, the late Terry Patton, dear friend of mine, uh, had a conversation with her a few years ago. And then Michael Shaw had a conversation. So all three of those conversations with Meg Wheatley, they're very different. And I encourage you, make time for the Perrys, Jordan and Karen Perry, and make time for Meg Wheatley. Also these, Catherine Ingram and Joanna Macy. I highly recommend. I mean, I've got 90 post-doom conversations, but these are the ones that are pertaining exactly to what I'm talking about in this program. And in many cases, saying things better than I am. And then just literally last week, a week ago today, I had a conversation with Carolyn Baker uh, on her new book, Undaunted, Living Fiercely into Climate Meltdown in an Authoritarian World. And then this one, one of the very first, most people have never heard of Daniel Dancer. Please watch this. Connie spent four days adding all kinds of incredible visual images. Um, and this is especially good for parents and grandparents. Uh, the, it will leave you in tears at the end. For young people, parents and grandparents, I've also done two sermons recently. The big picture, what every young person and grandparent should know, and then a Zoom sermon, Parenting and Grandparenting and Contracting Crazy-Making Times. So these are two shorter. One was in person, one was Zoom. Hope-free acceptance. Being hope-free. That's trust in reality, what I'm calling faith in God, faith in life, that is neither hopeful nor hopeless. It's not about believing anything. Grief, Stephen Jenkinson says, requires us to know the time we're in. The great enemy of grief is hope. Hope is the four-letter word for people who are unwilling to know things for what they are. Our time requires us to be hope-free, to burn through the false choice of being hopeful or hopeless. They are two sides of the same con job. Grief is required to proceed. And Joanna Macy famously said, the depth of your grief is the measure of your love. You wouldn't be feeling grief if you didn't love. So grief, of course, is not just a feeling. There are Kubler-Ross had the famous stages of grief, and often we cycle back and forth. It's not just a linear thing. But denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, and then trust is finding the benefits. It's finding the gift. And denial, anger, bargaining, and depression feels like doom. But trust, finding the gift, this is post-doom, no gloom. It's hope-free is this place of acceptance and gallows humor. I first got that from Guy McPherson. He calls gallows humor a process in the stage of grief, and I couldn't agree more. Here are some examples, and I'll conclude this way. The end is nigh. 
there was a time I would have dismissed him as a crank. So according to your chart, you've been experiencing brief surges of hope followed by prolonged waves of dread. Please note, the post-apocalyptical fiction section has been moved to current affairs. I know you wrote this as a bleak vision of a dystopian future, but today we can sell it as a fond remembrance of the good old days. A few of us are going out after work to pretend it's not the end of the world if you want to join us. Here's a final note of encouragement. Expect to bounce back and forth between hope and fear, hope and fear, if, despite everything you've learned, you do not accept that the collapse of industrial civilization is both ongoing and unstoppable. The pace and region-by-region region impacts of abrupt climate mayhem do not need to be certified by science in order to accept that they are real and will rapidly worsen. So don't take anything for granted. Celebrate it all. Live life fully. Love the life you live. And be the biggest blessing to others that you can for as long as you can. This, I suggest, is the key to experiencing joy independent of circumstances, even at Teotihuacan and probable near-term human extinction. And that's the gold. So coming back, how can you tell whether you're accepting or resisting that we're in a time of global hospice? Because of your feelings. Feelings commonly associated with acceptance are these, trust and gratitude, awe, love, sweet grief, generosity and compassion, calm, courageous love and action, and joy in the little things, gallows humor. Feelings commonly associated with non-acceptance are optimism or pessimism, hope or hopelessness, anxiety, fear, guilt, desperate activism, anger and depression, and self-righteousness. And again, these first two or first four, optimism and pessimism, hopefulness and hopelessness, are absurd in light of natural laws, facts, 99% certainties. So if you hang out in some of this, Please watch this again. I'll conclude with this quote. Remember, I talked about the forests are collapsing, uh, but we don't know it if we don't have an ecological understanding of collapse. Well, Robin Wall Kimmer, she talked about the four R's of right relationship to reality, respect, responsibility, reciprocity, and reverence. She's the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. Seven years later, it's still on the New York Times bestseller list. I think it's number nine or 10 right now. And she records the whole thing in her, in her own voice, Braiding Sweetgrass, the audio recording. I highly encourage that. It'll bring you to tears. Many, many chapters will. And here's a fabulous quote. Action on behalf of life transforms. Because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal, it's not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. And that is true even if we go extinct in the near term. I'll conclude with these quotes. Do not lose heart. We were made for these times. When a civilization is in decline, optimism is cowardice. We need courage, not hope, to face climate change. Courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. And I love this practical one, Chris Martinson. Plant a garden, meet your neighbors, practice generosity, learn new skills, control what you can, and leave the rest. That's my main website, postdoom.com. Thank you for your time.